Dr. John Lloyd. And uh, I know all of you know John. He's a comprehensive ophthalmologist and a refractive surgeon at Sunnybrook. And of course, he's our residency program director. And uh, John will be speaking on resident education, past, present, and future. Um, and this is a very timely topic because, uh, as most of you know, we just had our Royal College review of uh, our uh, postgraduate residency program, and we received the best possible result, uh, full accreditation uh, with a regular review in, uh, in eight years' time. And uh, uh, really, this, uh, this is uh, uh, largely due to John. A huge congratulations to Dr. Lloyd. On, uh, on such a stellar uh, outcome. You know, I, I, I really think John is, is the consummate program director. Um, it's a thankless job. He, he has to be residence advocates with, with the faculty. And so all the faculty are, are, are mad at him. And, and he, he's, he's the faculty's advocate uh, with the residents. And so the residents are never happy with him. So no one is really happy with him. Um, and, uh, and he has to take satisfaction that he does uh, uh, the job well, but he walks that tightrope wonderfully. Um, we know how much he cares about the residents and uh, the residency program, and, and we've certainly seen the, the program uh, uh, flourish. Of course, you know, the, the, it, it takes a, a big village to run a, a quality program like ours, and we have superb teachers, and you see Amandeep and uh, Alan, uh, our other leaders, uh, vice chair education and associate program directors, um, a big thank you to, to everyone that uh, is involved in this program, but a, a special thanks uh, uh, to John. And uh, on this uh, uh, wonderful occasion of, uh, of full accreditation, um, John will be speaking on, uh, on the resident education, past, present, and future. But before we let you start, John, uh, I'm going to ask Amandeep to uh, uh, say, say a few things. Yeah, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the final Grand Rounds of the calendar year. Um, and what a year it's been. So I would like to wish everyone a very happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, a happy Kwanzaa, and happy New Year. Be safe and enjoy this time with your families. It is really my pleasure to, um, to reintroduce John Lloyd, our program director, to, to all of you. Uh, you well know him. Now, what you may not know about him is during the nine to five when he's at work or the eight to five to us and to his colleagues and to his patients, he's Dr. Lloyd. And he's a very serious Dr. Lloyd. But after hours, he comes home and he logs into his computer and he, he has an alter ego, which many of you may not know about. And he is the villainous eye. And the villainous eye goes online and shares with a community of board game geeks. And they, they paint miniature figurines. And you know what, you may say this is pretty nerdy and you're probably right, but <laughs> it is also quite, it's quite impressive. He takes those microsurgical skills from the OR and he takes them home and he produces some very impressive figurines. And so here's an example of some figurines that he's painted. And we got Pablo Escobar as well. And look at the level of detail, not just on the figurine, but the, the palm trees on his shirt. It's quite impressive actually. And the other thing we often hear our residents say is, you know, Lloyd is just full of it and just blowing smoke again. And you, you know what? They're right. So <laughs> he does have a really fun side. It is uh, my pleasure to, to welcome John who is a very kind, um, dedicated and patient educator. He was my program director. He was fantastic for me as a resident. Um, and he has been just a, a great role model um, in my work as his associate program director. So welcome John, and I look forward to your talk. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Sharif and Amandeep, for uh, 
both uh, introducing me and uh, outing me, although I've done a pretty good job on outing myself over the years. Uh, as you're going to see with this talk, one of my other nerdy interests is um, a love of history. And I find that this is interesting and helps us to understand uh, both where we've come from and, and where we're headed. So uh, I'm going to give this talk this morning on resident education, past, present, and future. And I'm also going to give a brief shout out to um, one of uh, the late uh, and great teachers and mentors in our program, who is uh, Dr. William or Bill McRae. So this talk is uh, dedicated to uh, Bill's memory. And here is Bill McRae. Well, he graduated from uh, Toronto and got his MD in 65, and he <clears throat> did his residency here, where he was uh, one of the, the, <clears throat> the main instructors and mentors for generations of uh, Toronto uh, residents. And he also did his fellowship in genetics at Johns Hopkins. And you're going to see uh, Johns Hopkins resonate throughout a bit of the beginning of this talk. Certainly for Bill, teaching was a calling. And he really, really believed, and I think we can learn from this, that uh, we now, as teachers, really must take responsibility for the next generation of eye surgeons. We must make sure that <clears throat> we put the patient first, but then our students, and then only finally ourselves. And for this reason, uh, Bill won the Millennium Mentor Award. And when he retired from practice uh, in 2010, he was also the winner of the Excellence in Postgraduate Education. And uh, at that time, was established also the William McRae Fund for Excellence in Ophthalmic Education. So when I speak on this talk today, I'm going to cover a few things. I, as I said, I'm going to speak on the past, present, and future of residency education. <clears throat> Please don't turn out for the past. I think it's actually quite interesting, and it uh, explains uh, a lot of our day-to-day -day life that we live today. So in the past, well, it turns out that I was somewhat surprised to learn that the legacy of medical education in North America actually arises in Scotland. And as you can tell from his name, Bill McRae is from Clan McRae, who also <clears throat> are from Scotland. And I was interested to see that his clan were actually the constables of one of the most famous castles in the world, Eileen Donan Castle, which I visited, many of you have visited, and if you haven't been to Scotland, when you go, you must see it. It is one of the most picturesque castles in the world. And although Clan McRae has nothing specifically to do with uh, the Edinburgh Medical School, other than they are also from Scotland, it is the oldest medical school in the UK, and one of the oldest in the English-speaking world. And Edinburgh was putting out <clears throat> and training physicians that came from the new continent. And two of them, William Shippen and John Morgan, were the ones to start the first medical school in Philadelphia. Now, Shippen was a professor of anatomy, surgery, and midwifery, and it wasn't <clears throat> considered all that uh, reasonable to be a male midwife in those days, such that many mobs used to break into his office. And his lectures in anatomy required that he and his father dig up graves to get their uh, specimens. And so in his community, people had to stand watch over their, their uh, family members' graves or the Shippen family would dig them up. And these two physicians, both trained in Edinburgh, opened up the first medical school and started a bonanza of medical schools all across the United States. And it was big business. And at this time, Canada did not have any medical schools, so interested and prospective Canadian physicians would travel to the US and attend one of the many schools that had arisen there. So when did Canada finally get with the program? Well, part of it was in response to the fact that the medical students down there had very little regulation and were primarily commercial enterprises. And they said, we need to do better. And so now, four more Edinburgh trained physicians in Montreal, rather than Toronto, opened up the Mon Montreal Medical Institution, which was Canada's first medical school. And U of T followed not that long thereafter in 1843. And you may say, well, what does this boring history have to do with anything? <clears throat> well, it turns out that there was really one man who took this free-for-all of medical schools and turned it into the institutions that we have today. And if you look, Abraham Flexner wasn't even a doctor. He was an educator, however, and his <clears throat> main influence was his Flexner Report, published in 1910, which improved the prerequisites for entering medical school established a scientific training and background, determined that it would be four years of study, indicated that medical schools should control the instructions in hospitals, and that they should also be part of a university. 
And after the Flexner report, about 50% of the US medical schools shut down and the Canadian medical schools went a, underwent a serious overhaul in terms of their rigors and standards, although none were shut. And if you notice, history actually tends to repeat itself. We are undergoing a proliferation of medical schools around the world that are also big business. And I'm not saying this is necessarily bad or good. Many of these schools do offer high quality education, but this is a repeat of the bonanza that went on in the late 1700s in the US. It's estimated there are as many Canadians training in Irish medical schools as there are in the first year classes in medicine in Canada. And there are seven offshore medical training significant numbers of offshore medical students. And the Caribbean has gone wild with medical schools and lists 49 medical schools that train primarily offshore doctors. So that's medical school, but how is it that we have residency in education in Canada? Well, this is primarily due to Sir William Osler, who was a Canadian physician. And as we know, one of the institutes of uh, healthcare in the GTA is named after him. He went to McGill and then University of Pennsylvania and then Johns Hopkins. And if, so if you notice, all the major players, McGill, our first medical school, University of Pennsylvania, where the first medical school in the US was, and then became physician in chief at John Hopkins. And it's there that he created both the third and fourth year clinical clerkship, journal clubs, teaching rounds, and he gave us the medical residency which was an open-ended affair lasting mm, an uncertain length of time, but often seven or eight years, full time in the hospital, sleeping in the hospital, and leading a restricted, almost monastic life. Pay was minimal at that time beyond just room board and laundry services. It was assumed that people had nothing to do besides live in the hospital, be resident there, and train in medicine. And here you will see William Osler's first group of interns or residents in April of 1889, and somewhat unsurprisingly at that time, it was all unmarried white men, and they were not allowed or expected to marry at any point during their training. And no mention of history would be complete when we're talking about ophthalmology residency without talking about Dr. Walter, sorry, Dr. Walter Walker Wright, who of course got his MD at the University of Toronto, and then went over to the UK where he trained in ophthalmology and became a specialist treating people during World War I. Following this, he returned to Toronto where he became the chief at Sick Kids and eventually became the chief of her whole department in the 40s and the chair. And he was the one that organized the first ophthalmology residency system in Canada, training specialists primarily uh, to work in World War II. He was of course a pioneer in amblyopia and strabismus. And we <clears throat> celebrate him every year, except this year, unfortunately due to COVID with our Walker, <clears throat> Walter Wright lectureship. Well, that's enough history for now, but I will say that any of you who are interested in history like I am, uh, we have some excellent information on our own DOVS website, and here is some of the additional information that you can find. Now, the Royal College dates all the way back to the 1930s and didn't really change except for merging to just fellowship certification only in the 70s. And we have now over 80 disciplines and the way the system works is that each discipline has a specialty committee. And so, for example, in ophthalmology, our ophthalmology specialty committee determines how long residency will be, and it sets the fellowship examination for our field. And really, the Royal College hasn't changed substantially since the early 20s, except for the uh, <clears throat> change to fellowship only in the 70s, until the introduction of the CanMeds roles in 1996, which were adjusted and refined a couple of times, but that's the system that we've had. And I'm familiar with this system because I became program director and the Royal College set what are called B standards for residency. A standards apply to the institution hosting the residency and B standards for, for all residency programs. And they simply included things, and I'm sure Alan will remember this because these are the forms he would have had to fill out during his time as program director the various standards that we have to ensure that we meet. And then of course you would drill down and there'd be many, many details of all the various points that must be met. So this is great. We went through an internal review under this system. We had documents. Well, of course, as we headed into the latest Royal College review, they changed it all. 
and this is not to be confused with competency by design, which I'll get to later in the talk, that the purpose of this change was to harmonize all the standards between the Royal College, the College of Family Physicians, and the College of Medicines du Quebec, and harmonize things. Well, <clears throat> as you can see, it was a change, but it was really a bold and innovative way to do pretty much the same thing that's what's been done for, well, not just 25, but 125 years. So they gave us domain standards, elements, requirements. This was the one for institutions and similarly for residency programs. And here you can see, instead of be calling B standards, they're just standards one through nine. And again, you can drill down and see all the details that we must meet as a residency program. And these are far longer. I've just taken the initial snippets of each of the do domains and the standards within them. Many of it, or much of it, is much the same as the previous system. But one significant change is a real emphasis, and this is something that we will look to continue doing as we move forward through residency um, development, continuous improvement in our residency program. So this brings us to the present. Well, the Royal College has documents defining residency and they are created by the chairs and the printers across Canada. And I will confess that I didn't really even know this for <clears throat> uh, probably a couple of years during the beginning of my time as program director. I assumed that these were made and immutable until I finally realized that I myself was a member of the community that actually created these documents, but they change slowly. So the STR is our specialty training requirements and it defines what our foundational year will be and then the, what defines what the remainder of our four years will be. Notice that it says should. We do have some latitude to determine exactly how we piece together our foundational year. It should and not must. And if you notice down below, 2.9 is that we must offer three months of training in research. And we do do this by offering our residents time off for research, but nowhere in this process is they're saying that the residents must actually complete any research. They must simply do three months of it. And so we have worked hard over the last few years to change that, to make it not a three month to the, to the date uh, mandate, but simply the requirement that a research project or a scholarly activity must be completed during residency. And then finally, we have the objectives of training in the specialty of ophthalmology. And again, this is where we drill down to some details and details as to what exactly our residents must learn. So residency at U of T continues to look somewhat the same <clears throat> from Alan's time to Wai Ching's time to my time. We have <clears throat> major teaching hospitals and an internship in PGY1 and our residents rotate through these hospitals <clears throat> over the course of their residency. And basically we divide the 48 months acro across the hospitals. And then the residents progressively increase in their surgical training into their surgical PGY-4 year. And then historically, they used to hide at Mount Sinai for most of their PGY-5. So when I took over the program, one of the main areas of weakness identified by our previous Royal College Review was that they wished us to have our CANMES teaching be both site, PGY level, and rotation specific, not necessarily the easiest of tasks. But the PGME office helped us determine how to do this, and we created a CANMEDS map and decided that each rotation would focus on certain CANMEDS roles. And we divided them up like this and tried to make them somewhat reasonable. For example, at St. Mike's in the junior levels, you might be more of a health advocate uh, because you deal with patients of a less many patients at a uh, more marginalized social economic class. At sick kids in PGY3, you would hone some of your communication skills with parents and children. And we created a new series of items in which we took them from something like 50 or 60 benchmarks to 20 benchmarks of which approximately eight were the medical and surgical things and the remainder were can meds, focusing on the focus can meds role at each rotation. We also created different benchmarks at different training levels. So a PGY-4 resident might be focused more on management skills, looking after the team, managing the junior residents. 
whereas management skills for a junior resident might consist of more how they manage the eye clinic and interact with the administrative staff. Now, as many of you may know, I didn't train at U of T. I trained in New York. And I did my residency uh, back beginning in the late 90s. And our residency program, like most residency programs, was very similar to what U of T did. But there were a few things that we did differently. And I'm just going to talk about the structure of my residency program for a moment. So we had, uh, like we do here, um, informal morning teaching rounds by many preceptors, but a formalized Wednesday morning series of grand rounds during which the community came together from all across Long Island. And these rounds were primarily led by the residents. And of course, they would have a rotating series of visiting professors. Uh, we had something that we won't be able to reproduce in Toronto. We had something called citywide evening rounds where all the residents in New York City came together to receive lectures by visiting professors from all across the US many of whom were local to New York. And interestingly enough, New York is so large and this has so many training programs that something like 20% of all residency, all, all residents uh, in the US are training in New York. We follow the AAO manuals and after each subspecialty, we had what was called a block exam, which was the kick in the pants I certainly needed to keep reading those manuals in a timely manner. And there was a lot of importance placed on the OCAP examinations. If you look at the second slide, you will see an Art Deco building that's been torn down since the time of my residency. But this was the Queen's Hospital Center. And it contained a general eye clinic. And we had something kind of unusual, a walk-in eye clinic, because this was a city hospital funded by the city. And its primary mandate was to care for uninsured and patients on Medicaid. And these patients could walk in any time with any problem and we would see them. One interesting thing is that all patients, at least all new patients, had to have some effort to document what their refractive error was. It was not a procedural heavy year, and unlike our residency, in which our residents are excited to do uh, pneumatic treatments under supervision in their PGY2 year, I was lucky if I opened up a Chalasian. In PGY3, we moved on to the private center uh, and still <clears throat> um, did some work at the city hospital. We saw inpatient consults uh, because it was felt that by that point we were senior enough to do those with um, you know, less direct supervision. We did pediatric ophthalmology, much like we do it here, and our procedural load increased and included all of pediatric surgery that was expected of a resident. And then finally, much like in Toronto, our surgical year was PGY4. This was split between both hospitals, but when we duked after patients at the city hospital, these patients were functionally our own. They never saw the attending, the attending supervised us, but we met them, we worked them up, we operated on them, and we looked after them post-operatively <clears throat> throughout their, all their procedures. And we didn't get much training in uh, surgical retina, but we did all the other things I listed there. And then finally, because I was returning to Canada, I remained on in the program for a PGY-5 year as the chief resident. Interestingly enough, at the time, and things have not changed much in American training, most residents graduated with about 200 cataracts. I had considerably more because I stayed for an extra year. So some of the changes that I incorporated into our residency program that are stemmed from some of my personal experience, and I don't take the credit for these entirely, they were with a lot of help from other people. We restored a little bit of importance to the OCAP examinations. Uh, which Sharif can certainly attest was important in his residency program. We moved our morning round, sorry, we moved our rounds to mornings, which are more conducive to residents being awake and listening, and also allow them to return in the afternoons to see all the emergency patients. And I also discovered that residents were not even buying the Academy Managers in PGY-5, and that's when they began reading them. So now we have block exams and we expect the content in the manuals to get learned and read during the course of residency. Developed a system for backup on call for a PGY-5 residents. Uh, this is a nice thing because it really does promote peer-to-peer -peer teaching at the resident level. It also means our residents are, are always available for a ruptured globe. 
not a great deal of change, but perhaps a slightly increased progressive structure in which all of pediatrics is completed by PGY-4. PGY-4 is the surgical year, PGY-3 is the subspecialty year, PGY-2 is the general year, and finally PGY-5 has a lot of latitude to um, plan for practice and tailor it to the needs of the resident in terms of their subspecialty career. And then finally, much kudos to my associate program director, Amandeep Deep Rye, for taking my vision of a resident-led cataract clinic. This stems from the idea that residents should at least at some point during their residency take entire responsibility for the cataract process by seeing the patients both preoperatively, postoperatively, and operating on them. So these patients are seen through his clinic and they really know from <clears throat> front to back that they are the doctor is their, the resident doctor is their surgeon. So we still have a time-based system. As I mentioned, it goes through general to subspecialties, to surgical year, to surgical subspecialties. PGY-5 has been present in our Canadian system since 1997, and the Americans are talking quite a lot about increasing the length of their residency system. Now, one of the most difficult things we do in residency is we train residents to perform cataract surgery. And training residents is always difficult because they have to learn and they have to make mistakes. But cataract surgery is particularly challenging because our patients are awake. And there is, as we all know, a major difference between an uncomplicated and a complicated cataract surgery. And I still remember the first patient I operated on in my residency, and he looked me right in the eye, and he didn't speak that much English, and he had come to Queen's Hospital Center with no insurance from somewhere in the Caribbean. And he looked me in the eye and he said, I have absolute faith in you, doctor. And without cracking a smile and looking him right back in the eye, I said, well, that's good then. That makes one of us. Well, one person who certainly had faith in our resident cataract training is Dr. Bill McRae. So as, you, as many of you may know, but many of our residents may not know, Bill had so much faith in our residency training that he insisted when it came time for him to have cataract surgery, that he would have cataract surgery done by our residents. And as he, as he would say from his generation, skin to skin, which means the entire surgery. And this was performed by two of our <clears throat> PGY-5 residents at the time, Cindy Lamb and Patrick Yang. And here you can read some of the quotes that they mentioned. Patrick, it was the most frightening and rewarding experience of my career thus far, but he also acknowledged Dr. McRae and his legacy in training cataract surgeons in Toronto, because he trained many of our residents' mentors. And why was it that Bill McRae had so much confidence in the surgery? Well, in addition to him playing a significant role in training our surgical mentors, he knew that we have great surgical teaching at Kensington. And much credit has to go to Dr. David Jan, who was the <clears throat> creator and driving force behind this tracking system in which we established a Likert scale from resident month of training and they have approximately six months of longitudinal training in cataract surgery at Kensington. And one of the problems we had in the evaluations before is that all residents were evaluated as a three or a four. They simply received is that they were about right for their level of training. Well, now we take away the, the absolute numbers and we train, we evaluate them based upon where we think they should be for their level of training. And what this means is that we obtain a graph of their surgical progress by their month that it ranges the whole gamut of the scale from one to five. And we can see the residents' progress and we now have several years of data in which we can look at and see when residents are falling off the curve of progress. We know exactly how many cases our residents are doing and they are doing far more than their compatriots in the US. Uh, most residents graduating with well over 400 cases. We also have excellent teacher metrics and we know how many cases our teachers are <clears throat> providing for our residents. And this means that all of our days are good for our residents in our system. And in 2016, Dr. Stephanie Lowe, one of our previous residents, presented some data on exactly just how much cataract surgery is going on at Kensington. And here you can see that almost half of the cases at Kensington are being done by residents. And of those, over 82%, the residents did the full case. And this is quite good given that our minimum teaching targets are 15% of cases for PGY-4s and 30% for PGY-5s. But even if we do no more than hit those minimum teaching targets, the number of days our residents spent in the OR will ensure that they will have graduated with several hundred cases by graduation. 
Interesting enough, Stephanie also presented on our complication rates. And reassuringly, residents actually had <clears throat> a lower complication rate of serious complications than staff, slightly. As you can see on the left of the graph, vitreous loss and posterior capsule rupture were actually slightly lower among residents and staff across the cases that they participated in. And even if you look at complication rates in general, where I've added the yellow bar, there was no significant difference in complications between the residents and the staff. Now, admittedly, <clears throat> this presumably has something to do with case selection, in which the staff are quite good at determining which cases the residents can do for their level of training, and we progress their complexity as they proceed. <clears throat> so we move forward with our accreditation recently, and this requires 37 documents, many policies, committees, and agendas, curriculum goals and objectives, narrative summaries, and even complete lists of our faculty and resident publications. And as you can see in the top right, these are some of the advantages proposed by the new accreditation system called CAN-ERA. One thing that is going to be useful for my associate program director is that there is a digital accreditation management system in which all the documents have now been electronically uploaded to the system. And as we move forward and then we need to make changes, they can be changed online. And we are going to remain on an eight-year accreditation cycle. And we've now moved forward to November, early December of 2020. We had our on-site survey. Many of you participated in it. It was virtual this year, but normally it would be uh, visited in person. And as most of you have heard, we received full accreditation with follow-up by, <clears throat> by regular review in eight years. As we went through all the various 1.1.2 and so forth standards that we had to meet, we were felt to meet them all with only one exception, which we need to work on, an evaluation of the learning environment. And I was somewhat surprised to see this because we have definitely made efforts at our residence working committee to review all the rotations and all the sites on a regular basis over time. And these are minuted and documented in our RPC meetings. But when you drill down deeper, you can see that this particular thing is evaluation of the learning environment, including evaluation of any influence, positive or negative, from what's called the hidden curriculum. Well, this is a new thing, but we are aware that this exists. There is a hidden curriculum everywhere, and we now have to look at exactly what influence we are having on our residents by our hidden curriculum. <clears throat> and this will be something that we will have to look at and delve down deeper into moving forward. Some ideas I had when I began as program director that I have still not managed to implement are a refraction clinic. Although this has been somewhat incorporated into the cataract clinic run by Dr. Rye. And we do have fully qualified optometrists in our program uh, who tells me <clears throat> he has a vision of helping me achieve something in this regard. I did wonder about managing to get our residents to perform LASIK eye surgery as it is the second most commonly performed ophthalmic surgery but it has been difficult to actually make happen, although the residents do now continue to get exposure to LASIK, uh, both through uh, the center I work at and through TLC. And it's been suggested that we should create a U of T-centric resident handbook to help our residents orient to our various sites and training locations and the people involved in training here. So moving forward, what is gonna be happening in medical education? Well, things have changed a lot from Osler's day, or have they? As you can see from my talk, things haven't really changed that much in medical education. But we are now moving to something that is called competency-based medical education. And actually, Canada is somewhat late to the game. This has been going, world, going on worldwide for a number of years. And Canada's version of this is gonna be called competence by design, not to be confused with CBD oil, which is also recently legalized in Canada. Many programs have already transitioned and we will now transition, COVID has delayed us a bit in 2022. Here's the Royal College website with information for those who are looking for more. And when I learned about it, and I looked at the, the new rubric that we're all gonna be talking about a lot in the upcoming years, they give it these names. And I thought that, well, geez, this looks a whole lot like PGY years one through five but it is gonna change. 
There will be less time spent in certain areas and more time spent in others. And we will no longer talk about STRs and OTRs. We will be talking about milestones and EPAs or entrustable professional activities. But it's our chairs, program directors, and various community members and Royal College lead physicians that are going to help us develop this. So an entrustable professional activity might include, for example, initial care for urgent and emergent ophthalmic conditions. And the milestones might include features of medical expert and features of the other CANMED's roles. So why change? Well, we've been doing things the same way for 125 years, and we've been too busy to look at changing. And ironically, it was Bill McRae when I started as program director and I thought that we should be still emphasizing the important refraction, he looked back at me and I expected him to agree with me like many have done and he said, really? Will that really be a significant part of future ophthalmology practice? And I thought, you know what? Bill, you've made me think. Things do need to change. We have to be aware of how things are changing. And this diagram helped me as a leader to think about change. If you look at the bottom left, we can think of residency education like a forest. It was established by William Ozer over 100 years ago. It's grown into a mature system of forest trees that we have today. But we get caught sometimes in rigidity, thinking that things must never change. And sometimes it's necessary to tear them down, or in the case of a forest, have a forest fire, and build them back up again into something new and fresh and better. <clears throat> and so those who think we don't need to change, <clears throat> we can be, find ourselves caught in the so-called rigidity trap of not letting go and thinking that things can be creatively destroyed and rebuilt and renewed and create something better. And these are some of the benefits that residency education that's based on competence will hopefully give us. <clears throat> it will help us train specialists <clears throat> that, in, <clears throat> that uh, feel this way about hopefully their training. It will also help us to identify residents who are not progressing as expected, hopefully earlier, so that the need for remediation can be instituted earlier and perhaps with um, greater ease. Now, does this mean, however, that residents are going to graduate in three years or three or two? Well, the answer is probably not. Residents still perform a very important service component. They are part of our healthcare system and they are funded by our Ministry of Health. So we are gonna still need their efforts as well as their education. And throughout the CBD process, <clears throat> we will assure that they are competent. And once they are competent, we will strive for excellence in their education. The only thing is to get the faculty on board. So Amadeep, I will need your help with this. So in the future, well, I just want to go over a few things in the future. So a couple of years ago, I gave a grand rounds and we talked about some CanMeds things. One of the things that came up is resident consent for cataract surgery. Well, as you've seen from my talk, we're already doing quite well in getting our residents involved in cataract surgery. But it is interesting that the consent process <coughs> for resident cataract surgery can be improved. And I encourage you, I'm not going to read it out loud, but I encourage you watching this talk to look at the te narrative text on the left-hand side of the slide. This was a former program director at Hamilton's text that he would give to his patients. This is Dr. Jeff Scher in Hamilton and how he would talk to his patients prior to cataract surgery. I think it's an excellent introduction to resident cataract surgery. He uses words like, a resident is a medical doctor trained to be an ophthalmologist. They operate under close supervision. We function like a team. They may do a lot or little depending on their level of training. If you look at the consent on the left, a more standard consent that just simply says, I consent to have residents participate in my surgery. And there's some language here that wouldn't be ideal if I was a patient, a student eye surgeon or a learner. And somewhat unsurprisingly, in fact, I was surprised to see the consent rate for patients consenting to resident surgery was actually 21%. You would think it might've been 2.1% with this consent. And Jeff Scher achieved a miraculous 87% for resident involvement in cataract surgery. So we already know that we fall somewhere in between, but I would encourage all our teachers and our graduates to think about consenting their patients in a way more similar to Dr. Scher for surgery. 
Now, I've gone over the fact that we have an excellent tracking tool for resident surgery, but I will tell you that within the next year or two, we will incorporate our tracking tool into an app that's been developed by Dr. Mash Darvish at McGill. And at program director's meetings in <clears throat> Ottawa, uh, he took much of the feedback that I was able to provide from the system that we've been using and has incorporated into the app that he's been developing with significant um, development money. He has spent, I believe, somewhere between $100,000 and $200,000 in this app development. I look forward to <clears throat> being able to incorporate his app uh, for the continued tracking of our residents and still achieving data like we've been achieving already. So looking at rigid education, well, it's called resident education because residents are resident at the hospital. And during my training, it was said the only problem with being on call one and two was, of course, that you miss half the interesting cases. Well, this has been an attitude in residency for a long time. How can I ever go without sleep? <clears throat> or sorry, how can I ever learn to become a doctor if I don't learn to go without sleep? And in Bill McRae's Live Lived Articles in Globe magazine, they talked about how when he was a resident in training, he would return home to his three kids and have pizza with them at midnight. Well, this may have been good for his training and the hours and time that he spent at the hospital and what he learned, but I'm not sure, sir, not sure this was so good for the mental health of him or his family. And when I was a resident in New York City in 1999, there was a resident that jumped out the window of their hospital. So this is not the tax, but this is this continues to happen. There is something about residency training that is extremely difficult. And when I spoke to my uncle, who had trained in the system that we've had for many, many years, I was hurt and astonished by his reaction. He said, well, medicine didn't need a guy like that anyway. And I think that's terrible that we've produced doctors that felt that way about resident mental well-being. Well, it took a somewhat offensive book in the 1970s to expose some of the issues with medical training. And this book is so famous that it's gave us some terms that are, uh, permeate our residency culture today. The term of Gomer, the term of bouncing and turfing and bouncing back. It's an incredible paradox that being a doctor is so valued by society and yet is so degrading during the training. John Updike said it does for medical training what CAP 22 did for the military life. And the book was considered somewhat offensive, but it did bring to light some of the issues and the deficiencies of this residency training system that was developed by Osler over 125 years ago. So this got me interested in the concept of residency work hours because I trained in internal medicine before I did ophthalmology. And one of the things that did for me is convince me that ophthalmology wasn't so bad. <clears throat> I think my internal medicine residency, the best part about it was <clears throat> it made training in ophthalmology easier. So one and two call was established by Osler and it lasted for over 75 years. And it took a strike in New York City to get that reduced to one and three, which is pretty much the system that I still trained in, even though I didn't train in the 70s. One and three call was standard. In 1984, Libby Zion died. She was the daughter of a lawyer and a New York Times columnist. And this resulted in a massive legal battle, including the involved intern and resident being charged with murder. And it was felt that perhaps these overworked interns and residents, this was the reason for the medical error that killed Libby. This is not entirely clear as what actually happened is she was given Demerol for a, um, some aches and pains and a fever. And she was taking something called phenylzine, an MAOI. And there was an interaction not well known at the time called serotonin syndrome that resulted in her eventual cardiac arrest. But nevertheless, this was finally a reason for the American Council on Graduate Medical Education to look at reducing work hours for interns and residents. And there were reductions in 1990 and a further reduction with public pressure in around 2000, and then a further reduction in 2007 in Congress. But what's interesting to me is that this has never really been studied. Is long residency work hours a good thing or a bad thing? It's always been felt that we need long hours and intensive training to get the medical knowledge into our residents in a reasonable time frame. And interesting enough, 
The first trial was the first randomized controlled trial to look at residency training, and they compared standard shortened work shifts to flexible, which is a euphemism for much longer work hours, and actually showed that longer work hours did result in somewhat better continuity of patient care, and somewhat surprisingly, at least in surgical programs, there was actually no difference in resident well-being or education. A further trial in 2018 in New England Journal of Medicine, however, showed that in internal medicine, although the continuity and quality of care was better in programs with longer shifts, it did have a negative effect on resident well-being, and there were high burnout rates. So where are we at? In Ontario, our payroll contract limits in-house call to 24-hour shifts, no more than um, seven days out of 28, so one in four, and no more than one, uh, two weekend days out of eight. And our program, home call, 10 out of 30 days or one in three call. And if you go in for more than four hours, one of which is after midnight, it's considered an in-hospital shift. But somewhat surprisingly, despite all these reduction in work hours for intended residents, data doesn't actually show any reduction in the risk of adverse medical events in the healthcare system, as shown in the bottom left. And interesting enough, from 1978 till now, there is still somewhat surprisingly high issues of depression and burnout. Maybe it's not surprising that surgery residents have the highest rate but it was quite high amongst all residents. And I thought, well, surely ophthalmology can't be that bad, but it's still pretty significant as recently as data from 2018. So what is the issue? Well, I confess I don't know. And this is something that we as a program have to work on, resident wellness. It isn't as simple as, it isn't as, simple as simply reducing work hours. <clears throat> there are many factors. And if we reduce them too much, residents may have trouble actually completing their milestones. We need other initiatives, and we must work on a sense of community and teamwork, mentorship between our faculty and our residents, providing adequate supervision and, and um, at all levels. And I think buddy on call and resident backup on call is a helpful thing amongst our residents. We did try resident shift work during COVID, and this is something that's gone on in other areas in the world, but I'm not sure it's the solution either. Certainly making sure that administrative and clerical, clerical burdens are not too severe for our residents is an important aspect. As I mentioned, mentorship may well be an important thing, and we do not have a formal mentorship program at U of T, but I did survey our residents for the Royal College Review and was very pleased to see that over 70% have taken advantage of the informal mentorship within our program, and that some of our residents without mentors are perhaps only early in their training. I just want to call out some important work that's being done by Dr. Radha Coley and several of her uh, women colleagues on mentorship for women in ophthalmology. I would say that this is one area where we have created a somewhat formalized system, and it shows <clears throat> that actually women in medicine are doing a good job at least mentoring resident physicians in both strong female mentors and having a residency mobile model, residents are now reporting five out of five on a Likert scale. And one of the greatest mentors, as we all know in our program, was Dr. Bill McRae. He certainly believed in letting residents take charge of cases, allowing them to make mistakes, and help them fix it. And Dr. Hall Chu reminds me of when he went, a, went through a case with Dr. McRae, and he had a terrible <clears throat> mistake. Dr. McRae had him fix it, and then Dr. McRae said, now get right back in the chair for the next case. That is something I personally find hard to do. <clears throat> now I just wanna digress for a moment and talk about what we're moving forward towards, which is competence by design. And here is where I'll ask you to wake up a little bit during the talk and actually read these two options. These two options here are going to be decisions that we make as an ophthalmology specialty, and we are gonna be using these decisions for the next a uh, very significant number of years. We have already had our work first workshop at the Royal College, and we are now choosing between two options to develop our EPAs and milestones. Option number one is what they've utilized at Queen's University, where they instituted a version of CPD uh, before it was official, and it has been used in fields like cardiac and general surgery. The focus is on the skills being used. So for example, well, I'm gonna give an example in a second, but the focus is on the skills being used, not the subspecialty domain. This approach means that we may have few 
fewer EPAs, but that within an EPA, it's huge. The option two is managing patients with various conditions. This is somewhat similar to the process that we use now, in which we train uh, residents in glaucoma or retina or cornea. An advantage of this approach is that EPAs are shorter and smaller and perhaps more easily completed by subspecialist faculty. This advantage will mean there are lot, many more EPAs. So let me give you an example. In the rubric number one, an EPA might be obtaining an advanced history and examination. And this would include an advanced history and examination for all subspecialty fields across all of ophthalmology. The resident might not complete this EPA for some years in their training, but there would only be one, and there would be small tick boxes along the way as they were making progress towards completing this EPA. Option two will be where we divide the EPAs and the milestones, somewhat similar to what we do now, for our different subspecialties. And this is where I would like to pull the audience and see which way you think we should move forward. <clears throat> so thank you, uh, m and for putting up the poll. So the number one choice is the more broad EPAs that are based upon skills and not specific domains. The second choice is perhaps a little more similar to what we do in which it is domain specific. So we'll just, uh, pause for a moment and poll the audience to see what you think we should do. <clears throat> All right, well, thank you very much for that feedback. I will take this back to the Royal College. Um, I will definitely say that uh, to me, it also seemed more intuitive to perhaps stay on the domain specific uh, thing. Uh, and, and uh, format, but the skills-based system would be more of a paradigm shift in what we are doing. Okay, if you can close the poll. So finally, what are some future directions that residency education may take? I confess that I don't know for sure, but one does wonder as our field becomes more complex and more difficult, that perhaps we may need to have even earlier subspecialization. Certainly, I think having our PGY5 residents able to focus on their career choices and really spend a significant part of that PGY5 year uh, tailoring their experience to their specific needs and training plans is, is helpful. I wonder if we may eventually see entirely separate residencies evolve from ophthalmology, much like in surgery where people used to start off in just surgery and then branch into the fields there are now separate surgery residencies for many of the different types of surgery. Will we, will we begin to see separate vitro-retinal or oculoplastics residencies? I do think we will see interesting expansion in simulation training. As Amadeep has already outed me, I'm a bit of a nerd. I like board games. I also like video games. And I have seen what virtual reality can now do. In that little pie graph there, there is an Oculus Quest 2. It is quite amazing if you never try one of these things to put this on and see just how far virtual reality has come. This may play a role in simulation. It may also play a role in global training in which we can attend events virtually all around the globe, including seeing and assessing patients in a, in a system that is far more like the real world. And finally, there will be significant continued advancements in technology. Even if you look at the field of cataract surgery, which is considered the domain of the general ophthalmologist, it has changed a lot. Cataract surgery has numerous advances, uh, further details, and this is why I continue to feel that uh, knowledge of optics and refraction is essential to those practicing comprehensive general ophthalmology who intend to do today's modern cataract surgery. All right, well, no talk on residency education will be complete without me <clears throat> at least acknowledging a few of the many, many players that helped me run this residency program. And I apologize to those whose pictures I didn't put up, and I apologize to those who I could only find a bad picture on the internet. But here are our current site directors. Although Dr. Miras Kandari is going to be stepping down from SickKids, 
and Dr. Mike Wan will be starting shortly. <clears throat> Paul Chu is a person that is my right-hand man. He never says no to me, and he's always available to the residents at all time. In fact, Paul Chu is still old school. He's from Osler Day. He pretty much lives at the hospital, even though he's not a resident anymore. Paul, you need to spend some more time with your family. Alex also never says no to me, and he has done some great work establishing a complex uveitis clinic at Kensington. CAMIR has done wonders for improving the junior residence experience at SickKids. Nuper has made St. Michael's a great place to work and has done amazing things to our surgical wet lab and also keeping it COVID safe. And Ed, of course, is one of our fa most fantastic mentors and teachers. He takes what I think is the hardest subject in our field and has our residents loving it. <clears throat> Thanks to two people who are prominently displayed on my screen, both on the slide and in the corner of my window. Both Sharif Aldafrawi and Alan Solberg have been great mentors to me and helped me in my journey as program director. Call out to Amandeep Rye as my associate program director, who's really helped with the workload associated and has done great things, in getting these Zoom rounds going, helping with resident teaching, resident scheduling, and done great work establishing my vision of a resident cataract clinic. Jennifer leads our undergraduate work and is also the psych director for Kensington. David Jan has been a huge resident advocate and helps institute some of the major changes in our residency program. Matt is doing a phenomenal job with resident research. I attended his lecture to residents on research just uh, a week or two ago. Great job, Matt. And Panos, thank you for all your work following the footsteps of Louis Giovedoni for our examinations. Finally, of course, a shout out to our residents. And I realize it's a shame I don't have any absolutely perfect pictures of our resident body because of course, they can't get together these days except by Zoom, as you can see in the bottom corner. And I'm not gonna read it out loud, but residents, if you're watching, just read my little blurb there, and you'll see that you'll look back upon residency as one of the best experiences in your life, and much like a vacation that you took that had horrible delays at the airport and horrible travel things. You won't remember any of the bad, and you'll remember all the good. And apologies to Sandra if she's watching. This is the only picture on the internet I could find of you. You were hiding well, and you didn't get my text asking for a picture. So there you are, <clears throat> but I'm glad to see you're spending time with your <clears throat> son who is now much older. And without you, Sandra, there would only be chaos. So thank you for keeping our residency running and making sure I know what's going on and when things need to be done. And finally, to each and every faculty member, both full and part-time, they're too numerous to list. I want to acknowledge you and all your efforts contributing to what I'm convinced is the best ophthalmology residency in Canada. So thank you. Thank you, John, for a great talk this morning. That was absolutely fabulous. I, I love the history. I know you're a big history buff, so that, that was awesome. Um, thank you for your leadership in this department um, and with the, with the residents. We're, we are very fortunate to have you um, as our leader. So thank you for all of your efforts. I want to uh, wish everyone a very uh, safe, joyous, and uh, healthy holiday season. This year is almost at a close, and we will see you all in 2021. I will pass it on to Alan and Sharif to close out the rounds. Well, I, I'll say thank you as well to John. That was a most informative talk about where we came from as a, as a training program and where we're going. And thank you for highlighting some of the issues and some of the challenges. Uh, we face, you know, I, I, I truly believe that our training is one of the foundations uh, for the quality of our healthcare in, in Canada, and it's wonderful to see uh, our program uh, standing so strong. So, uh, John, thank you for your leadership, dedication, uh, and a great talk uh, to end out our, uh, our grand rounds, and to everyone in the audience, I hope you have a, a, a safe and healthy and happy holiday and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in 2021. And I'll pass things over to our Vice Chair of Education, Alan. I just want to reiterate what's been said. And John, it was a great talk uh, from uh, the past, the present and the future. And I think that the future really, despite COVID and despite all, we, we've been through worse adversities. And uh, certainly this one's very original, something that has caught us all by surprise, but you've done an amazing job um, leading us through this. Um, I, I think the faculty and residents can feel that the program is on solid footings. If we could withstand this and shine, like we did with our Royal College Review, uh, certainly a lot of 
the credit for that goes to you, John, uh, for great leadership, great organization, to the RPC, to Amandeep and uh, Sharif and um, all of the faculty and the residents. So great way to end the year uh, on a high note and congratulations on your accomplishments. Wishing everybody a safe, happy and restful uh, remainder to 2020 and looking forward to 2021.